All right, well, nobody's saying they can't hear me, so I'll go ahead. Uh, so this is actually the first talk that I've given since I did my uh, defense last week. And so I need to update this title slide here. Uh, see if we can do this. There you go. Uh, that feels nice. So um, today I'm going to talk about interdependent diffusion. And when, when we think about the social contagion of ideas and beliefs, uh, this is kind of a new concept. And let me sort of illustrate what I mean by this. So this is a belief that had spread through the United States population on June 18th, 2015. The idea that uh, the treasury had announced that a portrait of a woman would appear on the $10 bill. Now, when some people saw this information, they thought this is interesting and politically relevant, and then they would share it. And so we could think about that in the same way that we might think about uh, a contagion of a virus is that somebody sees a, is exposed to a piece of information and then it changes them in some way. And then because of that change, they're then able to uh, influence other people. Here's another example. Uh, on that same day, a white gunman opened fire at a historic black church in Charleston, South Carolina, killing nine people. Um, now what's interesting about these two ideas spreading through the population at the same time is we don't need to know very much about whether or not you've seen and have adopted the idea that uh, the, the portrait of a woman will appear on the $10 bill is politically relevant in order to understand whether or not you're likely to think that the shooting is worth sharing as well. And so we can think about these uh, diffusions as independent of each other and that your adoption of A doesn't change your susceptibility to B and vice versa. And this is actually a really useful simplification because what it means is if we can understand the diffusion of one idea through a population, we can sort of stack those ideas on top of each other and linearly superimpose uh, all those different beliefs to get a picture of the belief set of the entire population. And this is how we've done uh, studies of social contagion for the last 50 years. Uh, your entire theoretical and empirical literature, everything you might see on a, uh, a syllabus for intro to social networks class makes this fundamental assumption that these beliefs and the things that are spreading via social contagion are independent. But now let's look at a case where that's clearly not true. Uh, so this was the day following the shooting. Information came out that the shooter, Dylan Roof, had associated themselves with a Confederate flag and found uh, motivation and, and uh, support for, for those racist ideas in that flag. And the same day spreading through the same social network was information that uh, the flag was actually still flying over the Capitol grounds in South Carolina. Now, if you're exposed to the first information, first piece of information there, uh, and you think that it's politically relevant, then when you're exposed to the second piece, you're more likely to think, actually, these things are related to each other and a call to remove this flag would be uh, politically meaningful. And vice versa, if you already think that the flag should be removed, then when you see this piece of evidence that the shooter had associated themselves with the flag, you might think it politically relevant and worth sharing. And so these diffusants are interdependent in that our adoption of A does influence our adoption of B, our susceptibility to B, and vice versa. And the literature on this is actually really scarce. Uh, there's a handful of papers over the last 15 years or so which even touch on this idea, and they're all theoretical and, and uh, sort of modeling papers trying to understand what would happen if this was the case. But the real question that we want to ask is, we've made this assumption for 50 years, um, can we keep making it? Or do we really need to account for interdependence in studies of social contagion? So does it matter? Uh, and it's going to matter if there's new sociological processes at work, and if we can predict new observable outcomes of social contagion, and if there are practical consequences. And to do this, uh, one of the things that I did was, was use a simulation model to sort of climb the ladder of aggregation from individual actions all the way up to these societal consequences. So let's look at a little mini example to get some intuition for how interdependence is changing the nature of diffusion. So we'll say that Joe, Ellen, and Susanna are friends with each other, and they have some subset of beliefs, and these are shared in common. So the shooting was a case of racial violence, and the Confederate flag symbolizes racial violence. So these beliefs create some similarity between Joe, Ellen, and Susanna. Now let's say that Ellen adopts a new belief that the Confederate flag is flown by the state government and that she shares this belief with Joe. So what does this do? First thing it does is it increases Joe's similarity to Ellen and it decreases both of their similarity to Susanna. 
Now let's say somebody else comes along and suggests a new belief that the state government endorses racial violence. What does this do? Well, Joe and Ellen now having this supporting belief may be more likely to adopt it in common than Susanna. And so their similarity is amplified and their dissimilarity to Susanna increases. And so what we can see is that individuals who are already similar to one another can tend to become more similar over time as they respond in similar ways to the information to which they're presented. We'll call this an agreement cascade. And so when we put these dynamics into an agent-based simulation, we can see that when we allow for interdependence between beliefs, we should see that the most similar individuals will become even more similar. Now, what's interesting as well is that when we start this simulation from a random initial condition, we also see that the least similar individuals become even less similar, as information is actually prevented from traveling across the network to uh, join individuals in the other camp. We also see that the population could be more aligned along a left-right political axis. Now, how are we going to test these predictions? There are a lot of challenges that, that come up when we try to think about taking a, an agent-based model where the, uh, the outcomes are, are observed at the macro scale and replicating that with, with human agents. So the first of those challenges is, of course, that uh, if we want to see any difference between societies, then we actually need to have multiple societies. And if the measures that we're measuring, we can only measure once per society, then we need to have a large number of different groups of people in order to observe those outcomes. The next challenge is that people in the world already have some ideology. There's polarization already out there. And so if we're going to see the effects of interdependence on polarization, we need to find a way to confidently exclude uh, the effects of this pre-existing ideology. And likewise, our existing social networks have polarization built into them, into the network structure. And so we need uh, a new way to look at social network structure in order to account for that. And lastly, there's demographics. So even if I took individuals who never knew each other and had no pre-existing ideologies, if I somehow managed to find them and put them in a room, there would be similarities between some subsets of those individuals. And we'd have no way of knowing if the polarization we saw was a function of those uh, demographic differences or was actually a function of what we were seeing in the experiment. So what I did was I created an artificial online social network and put people into that social network uh, and gave them a task. The task was to solve a mystery. And because this is an entirely generated mystery and, and every time we ran this task, we had a different automatically generated mystery, then we could say that uh, we had fairly good confidence that we weren't getting spillover from the outside world. So this is the, the user interface that these individuals would see. So they'd have a, a notebook with some subset of, of promising leads, things that were, they already thought were, were relevant and germane to the mystery. And uh, over time, they would uh, see the promising leads of their uh, peers in a social network, and they could drag clues that they thought were relevant and meaningful into that promising lead section. And when they did so, they would be shared with their neighbors. And so now here we have this opportunity for social contagion. If I think something is meaningful and I share it, then more people are able to see it and they can share it with their neighbors in the social network. Uh, and so how do we make these clues? The clues themselves are going to be the manipulation. So I started with a crime scene and a stolen object and I added three suspects, uh, two items of clothing, two um, physical descriptions, two tools, and two getaway vehicles. And then we constructed clues where we connected each of these things to each other. So Hayes was seen at the Daily Auction House and so forth. And we can do this with the crime scene and the stolen object. Now, what we wanna do is create one world in which there's interdependence between these beliefs and another world in which they're independent of each other. So these things at the moment are relatively independent. There's nothing that connects Hayes to the hard hat or any vehicle to any uh, tool. So to create an interdependent world, what we do is add additional clues that form the cross-links between each of these different concepts. And we'll do this for every possible set of interactions. So what you can see here is this fully connected network is a, is a, a maximally interdependent set of beliefs that are gonna spread through this artificial social network. And we can actually pretest all of these concepts that go into the clues and identify the ones that are the most self-similar in terms of being a priori more likely to be involved in the burglary. So Smith and Hayes and Jones are all names that were selected from a large pool to uh, be perceived to be the most self-similar 
in terms of their likelihood for being involved. And so this is another way we can try and exclude the effect of external biases on this particular case. So next we want to create a, a control world that's as similar as possible to our treatment world, but doesn't make those cross-linking clues. So we'll start with the, the clues that connect to the crime scene and the stolen object, and we want those to, to persist in our treatment and control conditions, because these are going to be the clues that we perform our final analysis on. And so we'll take Snyder uh, and his connection to the Daily Auction House and the burly man lurking near the diamond. And everywhere that those clues exist in the treatment world, we'll find the corresponding individual in the control world and give that individual the exact same clues. Now, in order to make the tasks comparable between treatment and control, we also want to introduce information that fills the remaining slots in that game, uh, in that, in that uh, notebook. And we want to talk about Snyder, but we don't necessarily want to say that he was a burly man. We want to give you some other piece of information about him. So we'll say that he lives in Cedarville. And we'll say that Hayes has a tattoo of a bear. And what this does is it actually takes that clue and breaks one end of the connection that would have been made between uh, the two elements. We can do this for every subset of clues in the mystery. And now we've actually returned to the case where these clues are independent of each other. So again, Hayes is now independent of the hard hat. Uh, and so now we have this opportunity to see these two worlds and how those two worlds evolve, paying specific attention to the clues that connect each of those uh, rim elements to the hub elements, the daily auction house to Hayes, et cetera. The other manipulation we're gonna do is we're going to use two social networks. So in this particular experiment, uh, I have social networks of 20 individuals, and just due to the constraints of the, uh, the visual uh, display of information, each of them have three neighbors. Uh, so we can actually create a, a network which we expect to be relatively low polarization, just because there's uh, no clustering and each of the individuals is relatively close to every other individual. And we can also create a world where we expect to see high clustering, um, sorry, high polarization, because there's high clustering in the network and there's relatively, uh, large path lengths between every two individuals. So this should mean that information spreads across the network slowly, but spreads quickly within little glumps. So we should expect to see high polarization in this network. And this gives us four different conditions. Uh, so there's a baseline condition, which is this low polarization network with independent clues. And then going to interdependent clues, we can see the effect of interdependence alone, or going from that baseline to the high polarization network, we can see the effect of the polarizing network alone. And then of course, there's the joint effect. And then we can compare the relative magnitudes of each of these effects. So let's look at how the challenges that I brought up earlier have sort of been addressed. Um, the first thing we're gonna do to, to take into account the fact that we're getting one data point per society is to have multiple societies, multiple small networks. And of course, the challenge here is that the network needs to be large enough for us to see the phenomenon but it also has to be small enough that we can run multiple replications. We'll take care of any pre-existing ideology by creating an entirely artificial information environment and pre-testing that information environment to be as uh, debiasing de as possible. And we'll also put individuals into an artificial social network. And of course, this web-based uh, interactive environment masks the identities of the individuals who are playing. So we can't expect individuals to align themselves with others who are similar on ascribed characteristics because they don't know those ascribed characteristics. So now we have an opportunity to see uh, how these uh, beliefs and the changes in the way we've structured the beliefs interact the outcomes. But of course, there are new challenges that this new environment places on us. So the first thing we have to do is we have to coordinate all these people to show up at the same time. And then we have to maintain their attention for the time that the task is, is live. And then we need to be able to make sure that uh, we can provide the experience that they need uh, with the web technologies that we have. So uh, I'll apologize a little bit for the resolution on this image. Um, but, but what I'm gonna show you is where every individual is in the game uh, at any given time. And so what you're seeing is the top, the sort of top envelope of that curve is the total number of people who are participating in this experiment at any given time. And then I've broken those individuals into categories. So the first green bar you sort of see off on the left is the players who are involved in the sort of introductory screens. Uh, and this is getting through to the experiment. 
And then uh, you see the time that players take training to play the game. So there are a few intro steps which teach them how to use the, the, um, the, the interface and the drag and drop that go into creating this game. And then there's going to be some individuals who are just waiting uh, for other players to join. And so what happens is in this game, we, we have to sort of oversubscribe the game uh, because some people won't complete the training and some people will be slow enough that if they were to take their full time, then we wouldn't actually get uh, 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 a game to launch because other people would have left by that point. So the, really the only time that we're actually gaining value from this is the time that the players are spent playing the game. Uh, and so what we want to do is maximize that fraction of the total uh, man hours, as it were, uh, that's involved in this, in this task. Uh, so all the people who, who are participating but don't actually get to play, they're, they're wasted to us. We pay them for training, uh, and we also don't get the benefit of them as a subject. And the other thing is that the longer people wait before the game actually launches, between the time when they, they arrive at the site and the time that the, the task itself, the coordinated task begins, is wasted time. And in this case, wasted time is, is lost attention. Uh, in order to pe keep people engaged, we need to make sure that they're spending relatively little time in that waiting room. So how do I do that? Uh, the first thing is that there's, a, there's this training step and we have to over recruit individuals to, um, to fill in that training step. So I'll, I'll give you an order of magnitude just for say we were gonna run two batches here. Um, so we might recruit 180 to 200 different players and, and they would go through training steps. And the first 80 of those to finish would be directed to a game server. And once they arrived at that game server, they'd be randomized across conditions. So we had those four conditions with the two social networks and then the two information conditions. Uh, and this creates a, a, a block of games and we can randomize individuals across that block. So you can think about in this case, block randomization on the uh, attribute of the time that they arrive at the server. And then the next, uh, once we've launched that game, the next 80 people who arrived might get uh, sent to the next game server and randomized to a different block. And so what this means is that individuals are placed into games as they arrive and so we can minimize that total waiting time. And because we're actually writing multiple games at a time, then we end up uh, wasting fewer for participants because those who are slower or um, take more time um, will fill in the second game. And because we're doing this, this block randomization, we know that uh, if we see any uh, differences across conditions, it's not due to the fact that we have fast individuals in one group and slow individuals in another group. Let's just represent differences in the, uh, the population itself. And then of course, to make sure that we're provisioning these individuals, what we do is we spread out the, the load onto multiple different servers. So uh, everyone who comes to training will go through a training server and then I'll send the first 80 off to a dedicated server uh, where the first 80 individuals can play that game. And then I can spool up as many servers as I need or as I expect uh, individuals to arrive. And so with the setup, I've managed to do uh, uh, something like 360 different players at a time. Uh, every individual showing up within five minutes of each other uh, and getting started and minimizing the amount of wasted time. So we've addressed the coordination and the attention essentially by getting bigger crowds to join all at the same time. And because of that uh, crowd size, we can more efficiently route people and make better, better use of the people who have arrived. And then uh, we'll just distribute those individuals across infrastructure. And it turns out that provisioning infrastructure is really cheap compared to a lost game or the cost that you would have paid those uh, Mechanical Turk workers um, in lost data if the, there isn't enough infrastructure to actually host them. So let's look at the results here. Um, the first thing we see is that, yeah, uh, that prediction that beliefs should align along a political axis is actually amplified by the effect of interdependence. Um, but then let's compare it to what we would expect if we go from a very non-polarizing social network to a very high polarizing social network. And it turns out that it's actually a relatively small effect compared to the effect of the social network structure at its extreme. But then of course, we don't have the uh, ability to influence that social network structure to move it between those two extremes. Uh, but we may have the opportunity to influence the, the interactions between uh, beliefs that are spreading by introducing new uh, ideas and, and concepts into uh, the social network. And then the joint effect really is, is marginally different from, from the uh, effect of the network itself. And then we can also see whether or not these camps become more distinct. So yeah, we do see an effect of um, 
uh, of, of interdependence on the similarity within the camps. Um, and then the effect across camps is, is less significant. Um, and we have this for both a, a behavioral measure where we observe individuals and what they're actually sharing and a self-reported measure at the end of the game. And then we can compare this again to the, uh, the network structure. So here we're seeing that uh, generally the effect sizes are between a third and a sixth of the overall uh, effect. So just to summarize this, uh, polarization can emerge in homogeneous populations that are well connected, have no desire to form groups, and have no predefined issues to disagree over entirely from the way beliefs interact. So what I've shared with you today is an experiment and basically a, a research process that started with a question, does this interdependence matter? And a, a theory which came through simulation and then through an experiment designed to test that. And uh, I told you a little bit about how we use the technology uh, and online lab experiments to actually uh, overcome some of the challenges to understanding that, uh, that question. Um, that we couldn't have, have done if we had been using in-person experiments uh, or, or field experiments with existing social networks. Um, so thank you so much for, for your attention and your time at the end of a long day. And I'm really happy at this point to take any questions. Thank you, James. Just to remind people, you can ask questions by raising your hands, go click on the participants link and you will see a button um, on, on the new window that allows you to raise a hand, or you can enter your questions in the chat. So I have one question for you. How, what do you think is the largest group size you could handle right now with the technology you have? Sure. Um, so always is this trade between group size and number of applications. Um, but I could easily have 100 people in the same social network with this technology. Um, that wouldn't be too bad. It'd be nice to get to the point where um, uh, you know, I could, could scale up to 1,000 or 2,000 individuals. And what's limiting the, um, the interactions at this point is the fact that the experiment is designed to take place over eight minutes. And so it's very fast paced. You're constantly engaged and constantly paying attention to what's going on. Um, a, a modification on this experiment that I'd like to try is to essentially make it into a, a web app where instead of playing over eight minutes, you might play over eight days and the information just travels a lot more slowly through that network. And when that's the case, uh, the, the loads and the latency doesn't matter nearly so much because you've spread out the number of interactions that you're having over a larger amount of time. Uh, and so the, the infrastructure uh, limitations are entirely due to the, the latency and the processing speed of the, the servers, uh, not to the, the software or the, um, uh, the design of the experiment itself. So as we get to uh, uh, a slower game, then we should be able to get to a much larger population. Hi, James. Uh, can you say a little bit more about um, what you're using to recruit participants? Is it Mechanical Turk? And have you um, explored any other possibilities for getting large groups of people in the same place at the same time? Yeah. Uh, so this was all with Mechanical Turk. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm agnostic to platform in terms of the results of the experiment. Uh, it just turned out to be the easiest way to make sure that I wasn't getting the same individuals multiple times, um, just keeping it all on one platform. Um, uh, and and so of course you know recruiting 300 people to show up within two minutes of each other is is no easy task um, as you know well um, and so the way that we did it in this experiment was basically to have a big mailing list where we had uh, 3,500 people sign up in advance to uh, to say I want to be notified of when you're going to run these games and then the days when I was running games I would send notes to uh, those players and say, uh, we're going to run a game at, at 12.30 and 2.30, and if you can come, uh, this, is, this is a link that you can go to to follow through to that hit. 
Um, and then we also open it up to the general enter community. Um, and in this particular case, the challenge of getting individuals to arrive right on time is the, the biggest challenge. Um, so uh, with mechanical Turk workers, and as you know, one of the things that will happen is that individuals will accept a hit and they'll say, I intend to do this, um, but it'll go into a queue along with many of the other things that they're doing. And so just opening it up generally to, to the general population uh, isn't a great way to get people to show up right on time. Uh, and so having this mailing list where we can tell people in advance uh, when the, the task was going to start was a really useful way to do that coordination. Um, and especially once we got to larger group sizes. So in order to uh, take best use of that population, we wanted not just enough to fill one batch, but enough to fill as many batches as we could so that we had um, a high efficiency in the use of individuals um, and their time. How large did your mailing list need to be? Um, <laughs> there was about 50% uh, follow, follow through. So um, we, we signed up to receive mailings about twice as many people as ended up eventually playing. Um, and that's not to say that uh, uh, twice as many people as, as ever tried to participate. Um, so I had 2,400 subjects actually play the game, but uh, something like 2,700 uh, engage with the training or accept a hit at any given time. Uh, oh, sorry, through the course of the experiment. Um, so there's some attrition there before you even get to the, to the gameplay. And part of that is probably because I had quite strict attention checks um, and people couldn't progress to the game unless they had passed the attention checks. So. Um, I guess to follow up, um, so you were doing this in Amazon Mechanical Turk. You've talked about, um, you know, thinking of a version that could be run more slowly. It does feel, I mean, feel like, and it was probably designed around existing games that people already play. Have you thought about trying to do something that's really just basically a game and not through Amazon Mechanical Turk people would play because they want to play the game? Yeah, I think that would be the way to get to larger populations. Um because each population is one data point, if we want to have populations on the size of a thousand individuals, which you may need to do to have confidence that uh, the size of the network isn't actually um, changing your results in interesting ways, um, then you'd have to go to a volunteer model. And so then the coordination issue sort of pushes you towards longer time scales as well. I did have a lot of individuals who, um, after the game, told me how fun they thought it was. Um, because it's, it's different than most people play. It's cognitively interesting. Uh, there's a goal that individuals really feel like they can get behind. Um, and so I, I'd, I'd be fairly confident that you could, if you had an interesting, compelling story as part of the mystery, uh, actually get individuals on board. Um, so I could imagine, uh, you know, let's, instead of making this something that you play once uh, with one manipulation, let's say, um, let's do a whole season of, of different mysteries or different ideas and, and tell each one of them as a story where, uh, you know, you watch a, a, a crime serial on television and each one is a different, uh, different, different world, perhaps with a different, different, um, different mystery to solve. And you can imagine individuals participating for fun in, in that style of repeated interaction. Um, and that would let us test a lot of different things. The other thing is that actually in this experiment, I tested just this one intervention, uh, well, two interventions with the network structure. Uh, but I have data on every choice that every individual made all the way through every single game and the state of the information they were exposed to at every given time. And so I think there's actually a lot of work to do uh, on the back end uh, afterwards to say, okay, so now what can we learn about uh, what causes it people to adopt particular ideas and particular beliefs? Um, you know, an easy one to say is, is what's the effect of repeated exposure from multiple other uh, individuals? Or what's the effect of uh, similar types of information? You know, your familiarity with the, uh, the subjects um, and the tools and the vehicles, et cetera, on your likelihood of adoption and a bunch of other different, different uh, pieces in there. Um, and then of course, the next question would be, can you predict what would happen down the road in other contexts based upon those micro level actions? That sounds like a fantastic project. You should definitely do it. So I, yeah, I want to thank James. 